This is going to be a, an attempt of mine to explain something I've just done for, well, consciously for 10 years. Subconsciously, I'm not sure how long. Uh, but usually I just train the horses and the customers or owners are happy with the results. It has to do with confirmation and older horses. Leo was uh, walked in for a couple of weeks, installed. He's used to be installed. And I brought out this picture of Man of War because Leo's front end is very much made the same way. And then I brought Exterminator out it's because uh, you can see he's made differently. This is an inflection of how to go about bringing an older horse uh, out back to training and I express older horse because they already have a strong inflection uh, of who they are about and whatever the training may be it could be jumpers uh, I saw the natural back in the 70s and he had uh, considerably uh, straight up and down pasterns and stuff that uh, Paul Green went out well actually it was Jenkins that, that did him but when you bring an older horse out again, whether it's a uh, Grand Prix dressage or whatever, the uh, racehorse, they have done substantively years of a posture. And a lot of the upper level horses, such as this horse was in racing, will stand in their stalls in a certain pose. And he stands in such a pose that his uh, outside of his right neck about two-thirds of the way down has a big huge knot because he's posed it's gotten cold out and um, and his inflection of carrying his long head and neck or long neck and head uh, and his uh, tall tall withers his very tall withers and this horse is uh, a good 16 three hands so um, you know inordinately I'd give him a double stall uh, but he's used to being in a 12 by 12 and so he does a pose most of the day um and so he's walked a little bit but unless they're walked a certain way and stretch out that neck and really walked they're doing the pose even though you're walking them every day so essentially he's been this pose if you will i keep saying pose but that's what it is for a good two plus weeks and so uh, and on an older horse, uh, and I had started him um, and just got him to stretch and start unlocking his pole. And um, I'm beginning here off the right hind leg on the outside. One of the things I've learned, uh, well, for decades now, uh, especially with race horses or any horse that, again, has had a long career, um, you take usually put the right hind on the outside because that's the least amount of resistance in a fashion because they've more or less worked off uh, their muscle memory uh, reflection is the short twitch off the left hind so you're sort of uh, going to their Achilles heel if you will uh, where I can um, ask him for a new posture without a lot of uh, resistance. If you were to start out on the left hind, you'd have the resistance of his mind saying, I'm, you know, I'm in charge here of my body, etc. And rather, you want to get rid of any resistance because his muscles uh, are, have been not stretched in the blood flow in the different groups and so you have the short and the long twitch so we start out with this uh, again just keeping the haunches straight and if you see the tail slightly to the left which that's because he wants to work off that left hind and not so much but the other basic thing about getting a haunches square even more so than anything right now is to keep all four feet the same weight so um, as I stretch the fuchsia or the, the tissue surrounding the outside of his ribs and then I uh, activate uh, his lower back and his top line and his bottom line um, I'm 
being sincere to one thing. So a lot of times on, on my work, uh, when the horses come together more, um, you won't be able to see this, but um, or if I'm going up the level, I'll take a horse uh, and really stretch them. Now he's used to uh, having uh, rings or what you would call draw reins on him. So he's not claustrophobic. And you're seeing, I'm sort of doing, and it's hard for me to explain this part. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting a wall up on the outside right rein. And then I'm uh, doing sort of like a gigantic uh, half hole hug. And I'm ending on my left hand. So I can unlock that pole. And it's sort of a, uh, a movement together and then you drop them so they can so they can have the element of um, gradually stretching them because it's just like you or I getting up uh, in the morning and then right away you know being stretched you, you gradually do it now because he's uh, been used to having um, certain pose and he's not claustrophobic you wouldn't do this aid on a young horse that you're just starting because um, you know they would get frightened and think that they're being hogtied or something but just as much as I gather him up in pull and my reflection goes to the left hand it ends on the left hand because essentially I want to get the haunches square and have him step deeper underneath but I really want him also to stretch and unlock his pole again he just started out so uh, he's he's his muscles are not warmed up when I did the big half hold there or the big sort of uh, I wouldn't call it a half hold sort of part half hold part stretch um, you saw a couple strides back where he dropped behind the vertical. That's his old muscle memory. That's when they put the rings on him. He, most likely he was behind that too. And the more impulsion he got, the more uh, he popped at the pole or went behind the vertical as a dressage people like to put it. So um, by gathering him up, much like in an accordion, if you, you know, if you've ever seen an accordion, or fan and then I uh, release it and then you unfold the fan um, it's asking him uh, after bringing him together and then dropping him to stretch on his own and then and because he's a classy minded horse it's not a problem for him to grasp this or any upper level horse for that matter um, now with his nose going up like that, now this is the left hind, uh, so he has a different inflection going to the right than the left, but that that's good because when I'm sort of collecting him together and going into my left hand, for him to unlock his pole, even if it looks funny to people out there that are used to seeing pictures and it, you know only a certain way, I'm really taking out of the closet if you will and showing the behind the scenes stuff that um, gadgets and stuff will not get you there um, so as much as I take I give more and you'll see I'll start unlocking and unlocking and he will start reaching and put it in still though if you see how much I have to counter bend him or essentially do a shoulder out which they did used to use in dressage tests. I don't think they do anymore. Uh, but essentially, it's because the left side of the body is, is shorter, uh, predominantly on most horses, than the right side. And uh, so, I'm. if you see his inflection counter bent like this, um, I'm trying to keep the spine horizontal, um, the weight of all four feet the same, and encourage him to stretch and get his balance because really he's just trying to maintain his balance and plus all his muscles are are cold and um, but as he goes over the ground balanced he'll start and releasing those places
he'll go down to the walk and stuff and get coordinated because I, I'm uh, not going any faster than he can uh, offer but the main thing again is to keep all four feet equal weight so he goes to the walk essentially because he it's relaxing it has less impulsion and he feels more secure to stretch the only time I ask him for impulsion is if he falls on the forehand now he's putting his nose a little out there but again we're going to the left now he observes the walls in a different different way he, he uh, eventually won't but um, the wall is, sort of tells him to come in because of, of his uh, career so I have to overflex him to keep that right hind from going out and him falling on his left shoulder that'll go away in this in this stretch exercise this is his first day back so we're, we're not going to you know, do a huge amount of things today it's basically about stretching and getting his uh, releasing his lower back in that pole if you were to look at that first picture of man of war he's he has the same on his whole front end well his back end too but the way his neck comes out of his withers and I put the second picture in so you could see how different that horse uh, exterminator was in his confirmation and this reflects on these types of exercises because if this was an exterminator type of confirmation horse you wouldn't uh, the idiosyncrasies of getting to the same stretches and stuff would be slightly different because the access points are different um, length of neck length of back length of croup um, uh, where the throat latch is and now he's starting to relax some more okay here I'm going now that he's warmed up his uh, loins lower back some of the fuchsia's gotten blood supply and stuff because he's ungluing his pole I've done a gigantic half halt like I explained earlier and I'm asking him to go forward off the hock which means off his hind end and step into a, a forward whether he wants to open up the trot or the canner I really don't care all I care about is balance and um, keeping those haunches straight so he chooses to open up in the canner let me explain to you the huge difference between warm bloods and thoroughbreds warm bloods in the 70s were uh, they warmed up in the trot because that was their hugest that that was their main thing except for tracaners and Swedish warm bloods which had more thoroughbred then in the 80s they started breeding a lot of thoroughbred in the Hanoverian and so much so that they started uh, the walk and the canner were their warm-up the thoroughbred uh, was built to do walk in in well essentially canner gallop and a lot of people get mystified they try to try to try to thoroughbred for 40 years and, and it's still not getting through to them so their bodies and their minds and their DNA and their hard drive if you will were uh, associated with more of the canner than the trot they were not in the history of the old warm blood they were uh, drive uh, carriage horses um, and uh, they held knights with lots of armor on them so thoroughbreds were bred to hold jockeys and they were bred to be mind over matter and they were bred to be light and airy above the ground that's why Klimka said if thoroughbred can do dressage it'll be to warm blood any day and he said it more than once and I, that's why I liked him so much <laughs> but if you look at Klimka's horses they had a lot of thoroughbred in them <laughs> anyway he chose uh, the left canner which 
basically his interpretation of left canner is uh, totally different than the new muscle memory I'm going to be giving him because he used it basically going around the track to the left going around the corner times centrifugal force whether it's slow or fast there's still centrifugal force and then the riders usually that uh, lean in towards the turn because they're driving them with the face and, and not from the loins and the haunches. So they're not going straight through the corner, they're bending the horse through the corner. Inevitably, thoroughbreds on the large part have a weaker right hind, at least in the Western world or the North American world, I should say. Um, there's an old horseman that said uh, to me when I was just a uh, teenager he said well it's because of the way they lay in their mother's wombs and uh, they're for 11 months in vitro uh, bit one way so one side of the fetus is is longer and the other one is crimped up and they're usually laying to the left well that may perhaps be true but we exacerbated on the racetrack by um, taking the babies out uh, especially in the in the states and it's less so like in Ireland and uh, England where they have long straight fields and sloping fields where the horse finds its balance. It's a different form of, of racing industry in, the, in those areas. But even in Japan, you ha they tried to rebuild the Irish way. You can see it in their training tracks. But we want to make a horse ambidextrous. And when we have an older horse like that, that, that has already his isometrics and his muscle memory built in I have to exaggerate so I have to bring out that left shoulder which he normally dropped going around the corner bearing the weight of the rider and um, the velocity in the centrifugal force and uh, uh, relying on his left hind leg to catch up um, and so like the right hind wants to go out as you can see there it's trying to go out and he's trying to drop his left hip so my job is to not only um, bring him back into training uh, but to undo his isometrics undo his muscle memory in doing so you have to exaggerate you have to take the horse out of his familiar envelope that's why posing doesn't work it doesn't work with the young horses to bring them up into a beautiful uh, context of collection. It doesn't work, especially on the older horses that already have a mindset. Ask any really avid golfer um, if the most important thing is to start out with a really good golf teacher because once you're imprinted, with your swing, with your grip, et cetera, et cetera. It's very hard to relearn. I, I've redone horses now for three, 30 more years, and they taught me a lot. Um, and I've done really well-minded horses, and I've done horses that are really not that clever. Um, and both taught me. And this, this horse is a very classy horse. Again, that's slang on the racetrack for basically um, a, a well-minded horse, an intelligent horse. Um, so all this information that I'll be imparting is uh, the horseman, you, the rider, the coach, whatever, you need to um, modulate with and synchronize with the capabilities, not just physically. You can have the best physically made horse, and you know it doesn't have much between the ears, doesn't have much intellect. You have to modify your training accordingly. I mean, it really isn't very nice to go up to a perfectly made horse, absolutely perfect, and his brains are um, not able to um, digest the intellectual format that I'm expressing here through physics. So bear that in mind in all my videos because all the horses that I'm doing at Global Equine Perspective are different. 
it does not mean that the horses that have less uh, cleverness or intellectual ability are less of a horse. It means that you as a conscious, uh, now that we're in the age of Aquarius and we're taking the exoteric out of the esoteric, that you personally have to be responsible for this. This is actually why the old masters did not share all their techniques in the old days. Um, you could call it a secret society, if you will. Um, and they did it justifiably because most people go and do other things in life. They, Whether they go to yachts and go around the world to their six houses or they have a nine to five job and have their three uh, um, vacations a year, whatever the lifestyle may be, they knew the old masters, and I'm talking about Schulteis, and I'm talking about the real horsemen, they knew that you don't live this and breathe this seven days a week. You do, it, the, old, the real horsemen do not take a vacation. They don't take a day off. Um, it's water, little drops of water on a round, on a rock every single day. It's not a crash of a bucket of five gallons once a week and you train your horse. That's not training a horse, by the way. Um, any more than uh, even your children go five days a week and I hear in some places they're going six days a week to school and I know when I was a musician and I was what six five six years old I practiced the piano every day seven days a week so that's so don't say uh, don't don't complain that uh, these uh, tricks, if you will, and they're really just techniques in understanding of the physics of a horse were kept secret. They were kept uh, and given on to the next generation to special people that live with horses seven days a week. Well, now that our world has changed so much and we have ridiculously costly saddles, we have horses that are being contextually made for riders so everybody can everybody can be a so-called Grand Prix rider. I was at a Hanoverian um, uh, breeding uh, judging thing and in my lifetime and I'm only 56 I've seen the Hanoverian breed demonstratively changed twice. This is the third time I see it changed. At least I don't know if they're doing it in Germany but the judges that are being uh, uh, given uh, license to determine the next uh, mares to enfold breeding Hanoverians in the United States. It, I have a podcast coming out on that. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, but they're making them into like gigantic cob horses, I would say more like a horse, like a saddlebred or American saddlebred. So everybody can have the pose that tall posture you have on a Grand Prix horse and not move. Well, that's ridiculous. When you're making a horse, you better know how to move um, because Piaf Passage changes in ones and pirouettes don't come from a posture. They become, they come from the horse first. So interestingly enough, this horse's posture, and then I'm, I'm doing another grand, if you will, um, accordion half halt. I don't know, I'll have to make up a name for it. But it's an exaggeration of what you see in the f uh, final half hold, which um, months from now you won't see me doing this exaggeration. Um, and when I'm on him, you probably won't hardly see me do anything because uh, this horse has the inflection of horses I've done before where um, they listen to you just. The, the hand, and that's why I'm looking forward to the bodysuit and the gloves and things, that you can uh, let your air out and the inflection of your, your the diaphragm of the rider and he'll have it uh, muscle memory and he'll go uh, drop his haunches. So you probably, I mean, in, in a year won't have to do any anything is to change your breathing, which changes your weight when you let your air out. Your body gets heavier and deeper into the saddle, and that's another podcast, of course. But right now, I wanted to get this 
uh, on tape because I'm exaggerating absolutely everything that you don't see the masters do on the Grand Prix horses, certainly in performance. Uh, sometimes in the warm-up arena you might catch it um, and they'll do certain inflections to uh, soften up the sides of the horse before they compete. So after that velocity of impulsion going to the other side, um, I'm just continuing to relax them. The reason why I did that canter off to the left from going to the left earlier is because he needed the impulsion. He had warmed up enough of his body so that we just do a little bit today being his first day back. So we didn't really canter, 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 canter. And besides, that would have been putting, that would have been a waste of, of the horse because um, part two and three, day two and three, I'm going to put together and it's, it's a whole different scene than the first day you're seeing. A lot of people say, oh gosh, isn't this boring? I had to slow it up for you. So you could see the inflections, the nuances. Um, it's just like going to a museum um, by yourself and seeing some, you know, um, new uh, art that that's kind of weird and doesn't make a picture, or even the art that uh, systematically has a farmhouse in it and people and whatnot. You go to the same museum with a curator, and they start explaining the artist and the artworks and, and the strokes of the paint and stuff. Then you're going, oh my gosh, I never saw that before. That's another reason why I slowed it down. So you can see the nuances of the long reins sagging in, in the uh, arching and letting go and where his hind legs are tracking. Um, and you train your eye. I've been watching this for, well, I don't know. I started when I was, uh, I guess, 14 or something with a Swedish coach. But now I'm doing a half halt and asking him to step, whether he wants to step forward in the trot or the canter, I don't care. But I want to keep that inside shoulder up and out, out of his way so he can really use his hind legs. And even if inverting him for that moment in time uh, helped unlock that hole that he has isometrically memorized. Now you can see how he's again there uh, trying to uh, hit, fall in with his right haunch. And so my job is to square up the haunch and really in essence uh, make a straight line on a circle with him. Not bend him. Because if I bend him he's going to go in the old muscle memory. His spine is going to uh, not be um, horizontal to the ground and he's going to drop his right hip. So I'm going to keep him as straight. Now uh, depending on his energy and, and his impulsion and stuff um, because the one and most important thing is all four feet have the same weight and both hind legs have the same strike off or power take off. So you have to jazz this cocktail, if you will. Number one, all four feet have to have the same pressure. And you can easily feel it in the long reins. Uh, you, when you look up, that's another reason why I can't wait to get the pads that are going to be on his feet. So you can see the pressure. And when it's all orange, that means all four feet are the same pressure. When one is red and one is a white color, that means one is is just trailing behind and the red one is is the one taking all the body weight. Usually um, going to this direction um, with the inflection he's in right now it, it's off balance but you can still have the same amount of weight and now he's getting muscle tired so that's why I put that up. Now he's going to try to save himself because I'm bringing his haunches in and now he's going to cross canter and then he's going to take a step in the counter canter. That's the first sign or should be to you that uh, the um, elastic acid has uh, come into the new muscles. And the new muscles being that I didn't allow him to fall in with the right shoulder even though uh, 
our spine. Now his spine is more horizontal, but I had to lift his head up and have him follow through with the hindquarters. Halting has nothing to do with the front end. Now those first couple of steps, his spine is straight. So back there was his first time he was, the lactic acid was building up, so that was my cue because thoroughbreds don't get tired. Good thoroughbreds are mind over matter. There you can see where I'm really bringing his haunches in. And there again, he's trying to change from behind because again, the lactic acid in the new muscles, uh, in groups of muscles are um, uh, building up. And that just means that the oxygen return isn't there. Now you can see to keep his spine straight and his four feet all the same uh, weight, I really had to bring in those haunches. So never mind about the neck and the head and the pretty picture because you're not going to get the neck and the head and the pretty picture dealing with the front end. Power takeoff is from behind and up through over the back. The back has to come up and the haunches drop. Then, like Bill Steinkraus said many times, the horse uh, comes on into your hands. You don't bring them into the hands. When the rest of the body is in balance and the horse's haunches are square, you don't have to put them on the bed. They bring themselves. See how he tried to canter canter? That's lactic acid build up. Plus, he's not used to carrying himself perpendicular to the ground and squaring his haunches. Because on the track, he was going up the lane with rings on and the rider was um, bending him into probably uh, his right hand because a lot of the riders unfortunately today on the racetrack drive a horse like a car so they're doing it with the face which I might add a lot of dressage people and hunter jumper people are doing here in the states it it has to come from behind and it comes up into your hand and they bend through the rib they don't bend through the neck and the head the head is 100 pounds it's not going to it's just going to make the horse crippled so now that um, the lactic acid's built up and he's going back to the trot he still has to be counter bend and do a little bit of a shoulder out especially in that corner because you see every time we come up to that part of the arena he looks at the wall like the inside rail of the racetrack so we have a, a mental muscle memory too and so to keep his haunches square and stuff I'm using his head and neck but as, as soon as the haunches in the uh, upper and uh, back come into line and the shoulders are free from the withers in the point of shoulder to access themselves the head and neck will relax and go into form and then he'll start bending through the rib and then we'll be doing you know uh, six meter voltes very very easily but he won't lose his motion his uh, power over the ground or his uh, um, suspension or any of his scope over the ground that's how you do extensions and through uh, a three meter quarter corner um, Carl Mikolka taught me that part but um, it's not about slowing down to have a full Grand Prix extent extension and go through a three meter corner it's about a horse that's balanced and his reference point isn't uh, the turn they're not looking at the turn same thing is a horse shouldn't be looking at the walls uh, should have the mental psyche more of a rubber ball like you throw at the wall and the rubber ball bounces back that's the psyche of a really well done horse whether it be on the racetrack or hunter arena or dressage ring so now that his lactic acid built up we just I just put uh, um, him into a, a trot and then now I'm using other groups of muscle and now he's giving me a little bit of longer steps he is overstepped from behind that's why I slowed this down if you went back to the beginning he wasn't doing an overstep at all now he's his overstep from behind is not only getting in front of the front foot print but he's elongating the top lower back 
and his whole group is stretching, much like if you or I were doing the splits or beginning a grand plie in, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, ballet. And it's very slow. And the slower you go, and you'll probably get sick of me hearing this uh, or saying this, the slower you go with the horse that's correctly coming off the back end, pushing off with the back end, up over the loins and the lower back, up over in the shoulders that have access. Now I'm doing a huge half fold because what he what he was doing there, he was throwing himself away in his confirmation. The actual physics of his confirmation were rambling, so he wasn't using the muscles. But when you the slower you go, the more muscles a horse uses. So when I did that gigantic half fault and then I threw him away, as you can see, the, it's looped. He had to access his own stride out with his muscles and not just throwing himself on the forehand. So there's a balance. Another reason why I can't wait to get the gloves and, and the suit and, uh, for the horse because you can see this in the, in the um, schematics and you can see it in the muscle groups that are heating up and cooling out. That means lactic acid and um, and you can see this in the pressure. Now you see how relaxed and his he has his pole unlocked, his nose is above the vertical and stretching out and his whole neck is being used to access his shoulder. His knees aren't just moving, his foot isn't just moving, he's not a saddle bred folks. Um, saddle breads don't really make great dressage horses but they are comfortable and you, you don't have to learn how to move in the saddle and correctly sit you can just sit there like a car anyway so now we're going back to the left side and um, now the hips are a lot more lucid than when we started up obviously but not for one reason we haven't been out I mean slow mowing this down I think I've been out here now approximately 15 minutes and his hips are moving and from having his stance and a cold stall and this and that and his neck has stretched himself it's not that pose that when we came out it was set in or the one that he set it in for over two weeks in the stall and um, and I've really facilitated all the different groups. Thank you.